the Law and Crime Network. I'm Michael Bryant. We have a doozy of an hour for you here today. I'm not sure, Producer Elizabeth, can we cram all this into one hour? Is that even possible? We have a brand new case for you, day two of the case in Georgia against Richard Merritt. This is, uh, I don't want to drop a legal term on you, but this is a doozy. Uh, this is something else. This is the case of a former attorney. His name is Richard Merritt. He's accused of killing his own mother on the day he was scheduled to turn himself in for a 15-year prison sentence. Why? Uh, for ripping off his clients. Yeah, doing a little embezzlement to the tune of almost half a million dollars. So he has dinner with his mom on the eve before he's going to go to prison. Somehow that turns into a brutal stabbing and beating death of his mother, of course, that's the allegation of the prosecution. Uh, then he cuts off his ankle monitor, takes his mom's car, and goes on a run for eight months. So today, just to get you into this case here, we're starting to hear some testimony from Merritt's probation officer, Steve Queen. Remember, he has the ankle monitor on. When he's having dinner with his mom, he cuts it off and heads out. So now the probation department's involved because, uh, you know, that's their responsibility. You cut the, the monitor off, we got to find you. Let's listen to some of the key parts of his testimony, and then we'll talk about it on the other side with my great guests. What was your relationship with Richard Merritt? Uh, I was handling his ankle monitor case uh, for Cobb County Pre-Child Services. Okay, and did you ever meet with him? I think there may be an occasion that I might have. I can't recall exactly, but uh, I was aware of his case and I uh, had spoken with him uh, on the phone about various matters. Okay, and um, was he wearing one of your ankle monitors uh, after, after he was sentenced um, by the Cobb County Superior Court on January 18th of 2019 until February 1st of 2019? Yes, he was. Were you aware of the conditions of his sentence in, in terms of your involvement? Yes, my understanding was that uh, he had been sentenced and he was to turn himself into the Cobb County Jail by that following Friday at 5 p.m. And he was to wear his ankle monitor until he did so. As States Exhibit 2, this is the Cobb County sentence. Looking at that, is that the condition of his sentence that you were aware of? Yes. And what does it say at the top of this page here? The highlighted portion? From the entry of this sentence until defendant reports to the jail on February 1st, 2019, as described above, defendant shall continue to comply with all the conditions of his bond order and his pretrial release requirements, including wearing his ankle monitor. Did you personally install the monitor on the defendant? Uh, no, that was another individual that went to the Cobb County Jail to do so in March of 2018, I believe. Okay, and after he entered his guilty plea, um, can, can you describe that, how somebody else was, um, when he was originally bonded out the previous year, um, was CSRA involved in monitoring him? Uh, not at that time. That was another provider that transitioned over us just a couple months after that, a few months after that. Did you take over the monitoring at some point? Yes. Okay. And did you personally monitor his particular ankle monitor? Yes. <clears throat> um, what were the parameters of the defendant's uh, conditions of his sentence and bond? Did he have any kind of curfew? He did, as I recall, he had a curfew from 5 p.m. in the evening to 8 a.m. in the morning that he had to be at his home residence in Stone Mountain. And during the time that you monitored the defendant, was he generally compliant? Yes. Did you ever speak with Shirley Merritt during the course of your monitoring the defendant? Uh, we had Miss Merritt's cell phone number in our records, and I think there was a time I was trying to contact Mr. Merritt, and I called and spoke to her, and she might have relayed a message, but that would have been my only time. It was not a frequent interaction. All right, and were you aware that a condition of the defendant's sentence was to turn himself into the Cobb County Jail on February 1st, 2019, by 5 p.m.? Yes. Did you make any specific efforts to monitor him that day, the day he was supposed to report to the Cobb County Jail? I made a mental note that uh, I needed to uh, be sure at 5 o'clock to check his GPS location just to ensure that he was at the Cobb County Jail. 
If not, I needed to contact pretrial services. Okay, and were you monitoring him through your cell phone? Yes, through the uh, smartphone app that gives us access to that information. Did the defendant turn himself in as ordered? No. No, he did not. So some foundational information there from the probation officer who would have really been the first to know something's up here. This guy doesn't turn himself in at 5 o'clock as uh, agreed on the embezzlement charges. And uh, so now he's on the lam, and this guy is going to take over and kind of find out what's going on here. Let's talk about this case. It is something else. Michael Corbatics is here. He's a criminal defense attorney in the New York area. And Catherine Lazardo in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, a trial attorney. Thank you both for being here. Let's just let's cut right to the chase because this sort of tracks from the beginning. Okay, the guy's a, a scumbag attorney, embezzles money from his clients. You know, he takes their checks as they come in, the settlement checks, and just uses the money for a car and a trip. Um, and so he's, he's a loser. He then pleads guilty to those things. Maybe he's finally seen the light. He agrees to a 15-year sentence. All of that tracks. Goes to his mom's for a kind of a farewell dinner. Then all hell breaks loose. And I, I want to know, and let me ask each of you, starting with you, Catherine, what do we think happened to, to turn this guy from a scumbag attorney who's pled guilty to embezzlement to killing his mom? Uh, there's a big disconnect there. There is, and the defense is honing in on that uh, with their opening and saying that, you know, there's no evidence linking him to his uh, mother's murder, but all the strong circumstantial evidence that you talked about earlier links to that. Now, how does he turn into that so quickly? I think it wasn't just that night. It might be just how he is as a person and how he deals with this thing. This reminds me of Alec Murdoch's case where he embezzled and then killed his wife and son and all of us are having a hard time grappling that. The same with this where he embezzled almost half a million and ends up killing his mother. Sometimes they, it just does not make sense what makes them tick. Yeah, this is uh, this is the new verb I've created. He he murdocked, you know. He kind of he murdocked this uh, situation. So, by uh, uh you know, this is a malice murder case. There's also some felony murder uh, counts as well. But I I could see a better argument for second degree, uh, you know, a passion kind of killing. That, but we don't see that here. What, what do you expect to see? Any maybe lesser included? I don't know. I, this is very confusing because of that. Because there's a lot of innuendos that are here is just when you hear the probation officer is the very fact he pled to basically a white collar crime where there was no violence. Obviously there was no violence they were concerned about and this is someone who's been sentenced where you go through mental health evaluations in your sentencing so there's no indication that there was some violence from what from what I'm saying you know I'm speaking generally here but he would have he would have been remanded as soon as he was you know sentence not come back when you're ready to turn in and that's sort of interesting here so i don't know if maybe this was just not perhaps this was just a mental breakdown and realizing what he had did to his family by stealing that money and in an obscure way thinking if he got rid of anybody because when you talk about murdoch that's what i also wonder i wonder how much is that i let my family down but i'm not brave enough to kill myself i'm going to kill you because I can't deal with the guilt I have. Yeah, and, and we know from the Murdoch experience that the juries have no problem making that connection. But again, innocent till proven guilty, and the defense is pounding away on the fact that there really aren't the forensic uh, evidence issues that you would expect to find here. Uh, so as this case unfolds, keep an eye on that element. Let's go back to more of uh, Mr. Queen's testimony. Again, the probation officer talking about learning that the old ankle monitor had been removed. Here we go. Um, can you describe just what you recall happening that day? Sure. It was about um, uh, 4 o'clock on that afternoon, and I received a, what's called a strap alert um, uh, on my cell phone via text. And that's an alert that tells me that an offender's strap has been compromised in some kind of way. So um, at the time, I was pulling up to the daycare to pick up my children that afternoon. So I sat there in my truck, and I pulled up the app, and I looked at his GPS location, and I saw that he was not in Marietta at the Cobb County Jail. He was actually uh, at a location off of Interstate 75 in White, Georgia, just north of Cartersville, where I live.
Did um, you obtain the attempt attentee records for the defendant's uh, ankle monitor for the day of uh, February 1st of 2019? Uh, yes, I'd uh, been requested by Lance Cross with the uh, DeKalb County District Attorney's Office as well as uh, Lieutenant uh, Keith McQuinlan with the DeKalb County Police Department to review his GPS records and provide those to them. And what happened after that? At 4.14 p.m. I received a uh, strap alert indicating that his uh, the strap on his ankle monitor had been compromised. I was near my home in Cartersville, Georgia, which is just south of that location, not more than 10 minutes. I uh, actually had a daycare where my children stay. Okay. What did you do when you received, and did you receive that alert on your cell phone? Yes, I did. I received it via a text message. What did you do when you, you received that alert? Uh, I opened up the um, Attenti electronic monitoring software application to look at his GPS location where he was. Um, were you able to determine where the ankle monitor was? Yes. Did you go to that location? Yes, I did. I, when I looked at the information, it indicated he was not in Maria at the Cobb County Jail, but at that location in White, Georgia, just off of Interstate I-75. And since I was in such close proximity to it, I just proceeded that direction. Do you know approximately what time you arrived at the location where the ankle monitor was located? It was probably 20 or 30 minutes after that, so around 4.40 p.m. Did you have police officers respond to that location as well? No, I did not. What type of location was that? That was a uh, TNA truck stop. There's a, it's a, actually a large truck stop, and on the other side of the road is a pilot truck stop right off that exit. I think it's the last truck stop before you get into Atlanta. Can you describe to the jury what those are? These are aerial photographs of the uh, TNA Travel Center truck stop down off the Cass White Road exit in uh, White, Georgia. Okay. And is that the truck stop where you found the ankle? Well, did you find the ankle monitor? I did. Uh, the GPS location indicated it was going to be in the uh, corner of the parking lot of that truck stop. So when I pulled into the truck stop, it wasn't hard to tell where it was. There was a lamp post in that corner where the GPS location indicated right under it was a trash can. And what are we looking at in State's Exhibit 55? I went over to the trash can, opened the flap, and I could see the ankle monitor inside it, so I just removed the top of it and took this photograph of the ankle monitor laying in the trash can. And what is this in State's Exhibit 56? That is the actual ankle monitor I retrieved from the trash can. Okay. A and had the strap been severed? Yes. Okay. Did it appear that it had been severed with an instrument or by hand? I believe it was cut. So it was cut with a knife, a pair of scissors, something like that. When did you learn that Shirley Merritt had been murdered? Uh, the next morning, I received a call from Kenya Jackson, the pretrial services director, letting me know that I was probably going to be receiving calls from uh, authorities in DeKalb County uh, wanting to know uh, the location of Richard Merritt and that uh, his uh, mother had uh, been murdered. Okay. And did you assist DeKalb County um, officers and detectives in investigating this case? Uh, for the most part of that day into the next day, yes, I did. So this is uh, long before they learn how long this guy's going to be on the road and, and uh, how long it's going to take to catch him, eight months. Uh, he's cut off the ankle monitor. And Mike Kobotics, you, you know, your concerns here as a defense attorney, did they just go in, the probation guy, go in and just grab this monitor, not check it for uh, other fingerprints or something else that might suggest that other person cut it off? 
I, I would think that would be a very strong part of the cross-examination. I mean, we don't know what their forensics reports or what the fingerprint reports were turned over to defense at this point, but as a defense attorney, that would draw my attention to focusing my cross-examination on, you know, who, how, do you, how are you going to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he removed the ankle monitoring? I'm sure the counter anchor, the, uh, he didn't show up for eight months, Mike, so uh, yeah. the, <laughs> just an accident. Are a little. <laughs> and, and, and Catherine, uh, it might be a difficult argument as well to say, well, whoever killed my mom then cut the ankle monitor off for me. Just, you know, kind of a, a little gift. Tough argument. Yeah. A very tough argument. I mean, the circumstantial evidence here are talking about uh, and what we've heard so far just points to him. All, all The fact that by 4.14 p.m., the alert that his ankle monitor was taken off or cut off when he was supposed to turn himself in at 5 p.m., 4.14 5 p.m. So very close in time. And then I'm sure we're going to hear from a, a coroner, autopsy report, uh, testimonies as to the time of that, the death of his mother as well. Yeah, you know, nothing says uh, consciousness of guilt like cutting off your ankle monitor, disappearing for eight months, getting a new name, taking on a whole new life in another state. I don't know. I don't know. Well, maybe that's an issue. Let's take a break here. When we come back, they are on a kind of a longer lunch break, so we're catching up on some of the testimony, uh, including this probation officer. We'll take a break and come back to Law and Crime.